Now we'll start with chapter 11, Control of Scatter Radiation. This will be the last test that we have this semester. We'll have this test the week before finals. So in scatter radiation, uh, remember that, that we've got uh, really four possible interactions inside of the patient. Um, we've, we've got photoelectric interaction, which is total absorption. We got scatter radiation, which is actually a partial absorption. We get uh, loss of energy and a change direction of the X-ray photon before it leaves the patient, if it leaves the patient. And then we've got transmission. So we've got two different types of scatter radiation. We've got Compton and we've got Thompson, which is classical scattering. Classical scattering accounts for a small portion of the, the x-ray beam. It uh, almost looks like penetration in every possible way with the exception of energy level. Uh, according to the literature, Thompson or classical scattering only occurs at low KVP levels. So what we're talking about is primary beam versus remnant beam. Primary beam is the beam before it interacts with the patient. The remnant beam is what comes out of the patient. So the primary beam, you should never be standing in the primary beam. Uh, the primary beam is before interaction with the patient. So when we're talking about scatter cleanup, we're really talking about either eliminating scatter before it's created inside of the patient or cleaning it up out of the remnant beam. So um, what we're going to talk about is, are the types of interactions. We're going to talk about the technical factors and their effects on interactions. Uh, we're going to talk about scatter's effect on the image and how it affects sharpness of recorded detail and visibility of recorded detail. We're going to talk about the technical factors on the effects of scatter radiation, how the technical factors increase or decrease the percentage of scatter radiation. We're going to talk about beam restriction and scatter. We're going to talk about uh, patient factors and creation of scatter. Um, we're going to talk about post-patient scatter removal. Um, we'll talk about the, the methods to control scatter radiation, be they pre-patient or post-patient. Um, so we'll talk about uh, the beam factors. We'll talk about other equipment and beam limitation. Um, we'll talk about inside of the patient, again, what controls the scatter radiation, what types of tissues create more scatter. We'll talk about um, post-patient, how it is that we can clean up and eliminate some of the scatter radiation before it strikes the image receptor. And we'll talk about the radiation dose implications for each one of those, not just on the patient, but also on you as the technologist. So a lot of the stuff we've already talked about, so this section is probably going to go a little bit quicker than, than the other, well, the middle two. The first section went pretty quick. The, the uh, chapter 13, chapter 10, um, take a while to, to kind of ferret out all the information, but in doing so, we talk about a lot of the things that pertain to this chapter. So contrast is difference. Contrast resolution is the ability to, to make or maximize the contrast, or contrast resolution is the ability to see the contrast. So um, it's not the same spatial resolution. We talked about that in chapter 10. Uh, we talked about uh, contrast resolution being the difference between black and white, and most of the time that, that we're we are talking about resolution, uh, what we're talking about is spatial resolution, which is your sharpness of recorded detail. Contrast resolution, if a test question asks about contrast resolution, it's always going to have contrast attached to the resolution. So if you don't see contrast resolution, then assume that any reference to resolution is spatial resolution and sharpness of recorded detail. And like we learned in, in chapter 10, spatial resolution is controlled with lines, with uh, angulations, with focal spot size and distances. So uh, grayscale being the opposite of contrast, latitude is the same thing as grayscale, which would be the opposite of contrast. The primary beam, we just talked about that, is 
the beam before it interacts with the patient as opposed to the remnant beam is what comes out of the patient. So the patient absorbs a tremendous amount of the remnant beam, or a, a, a tremendous amount of the beam. Um, only a 1% or less of the primary beam reaches the image receptor. Uh, noise is any kind of random fluctuation of densities on the image receptor. And remember, we've got two different types of noise, one being fog, which is scatter radiation, and the other being quantum model. This chapter really deals with scatter radiation and the fog uh, type of noise. Quantum model we talked about in the last section. So beam limiting devices are anything that con con contains your beam to a, a specific size, that it limits the beam to a specific size. <coughs> Collimators, diaphragms are different types of, of beam limiting devices and we'll get to those. And then grids are uh, a, uh, a device we use to clean up scatter after it's created. We put the the grid in between the image receptor and the patient to try to remove some of the scatter radiation uh, before it strikes the image receptor. So uh, again, going all the way back to chapter seven and eight, the main thing that we create in the x-ray tube is, is heat. We create a little bit of light. Uh, we create even fewer x-rays, um, but the x-rays we do create, we create in one of two ways. Most of your beam is going to be made up of Brim's radiation, and that is uh, radiation because of loss of energy. So the electrons travel across the tube very fast. The higher the KVP, the faster the, the electrons travel across the tube. They slow down once they strike the tube, and the, the slowing down they lose, in the slowing down they lose kinetic energy. So with the energy loss, we uh, see x-ray production and x-ray production is equivalent to the difference between the incoming energy of the electron and the outgoing energy of the electron. Statistically they say that it, it uh, constitutes 85 percent of the x-ray beam. Uh, BREMS means breaking or is short for bremstrahlung which means breaking um, and BREMS x-ray creation can um, it, it can occur at any energy level. So it's just determined by the amount of energy that is lost. So if you lose all the energy, you set uh, 100 kVp and that's the, the kinetic energy that you send the, the uh, electron across the tube with. If it loses all of its energy, then um, the energy level of the x-ray photon that's created is 100 kVp most of them are not going to lose all of their energy. As a matter of fact, very few will. That's why on the, the H and D cur uh, on the, uh, the BRIM spectrum you have very few high energy x-ray photons. So characteristic occur because you eject an inner shell electron and it's characteristic of the tungsten atom and the binding energy of those inner shell electrons of the tungsten atom they occur at 69.5 kVp, so your the the binding energy of of those electrons is actually 69.5 keV. So the the uh, energy that you have to have to eject one of those inner shell electrons is at least 69.5 kVp. So the kinetic energy coming across the tube has to be at least 69.5 kVp. We eject that electron. When another electron takes its place, we release an X-ray photon in the energy of the difference between the binding energy of the electron that was ejected and the binding energy of the electron that takes its place. So the highest possible level that could be is 69 and a half kVp, and we call that the discrete spectrum, as opposed to the the BREM spectrum is continuous. So again, the factors affecting emission, the emission spectrum, mass is numbers only. Uh, there's no change in the position of the bubble, uh, so there's no change in average, there's no change in peak, there's no change in the characteristic spectrum.
KBP changes everything. Um, it uh, increases the number, it increases the peak, it increases the average. The only thing that it does not change is the minimum. And filtration is the only thing that changes the minimum. So uh, filtration uh, does change the minimum. It pushes the, the uh, we get a higher KVP level for our minimum uh, beam energy. It uh, eliminates some of the photons, so we get a decrease in numbers. It uh, changes the position of the, the bubble so that we get a, a higher average. And that all occurs because the only thing that we're removing is low energy x-ray photons, or primarily we're, we're eliminating more low energy x-ray photons. And I've used the example in the past of uh, eliminating the lowest test grade, and if you do that, then your number of tests go down and your average goes up. Target material changes everything except for the peak. Um, and there's a, a graphic in the Bouchon book that shows the difference between uh, tungsten and gold or tungsten and molybdenum and the, uh, the emission spectrum changes, the brim spectrum changes, the characteristic spectrum changes. Really the only thing that doesn't change is going to be the peak. And the voltage waveform uh, doesn't change the peak, but it does change the average. Uh, the average goes towards the high energy side, and we get a, an increase in numbers whenever we go from single phase to three phase. So um, the effects on the image, mass is uh, direct. So if if we increase our mass, we directly change our density or our exposure. And it's a one for one basis. If you double your mass, you double your exposure. If you cut your mass in half, you cut your exposure in half. It's so predictable that mass is what we want to use if the only thing that we want to change is our index number. Um, so mass, there's a direct relationship. KVP also goes in the same direction. If you increase your KVP, you increase your exposure, but it's an exponential relationship. If you increase your KVP by 15%, that's the same as increasing your mass by a factor of two. So it's, it's direct, but it is um, uh, exponential. Filtration changes your density, but it decreases your density. Um, voltage waveform increases your density because you get an increase in output, but, um, and we'll just say it increases density or increases exposure. And changes in SID uh, are uh, inversely proportional, so if you increase your SID, you decrease your exposure to the image receptor. So welcome back through this. Let's let's do the thing, same thing with uh, contrast. So as you increase your your mass, you uh, have no real effect on contrast until you get into the shoulder and toe portion of the H and D curve. If you either starve your image receptor for exposure, or you flood your image receptor with exposure, and your image receptor can't make sense of what you've done, then uh, you can have an effect on on uh, contrast. Same thing with KVP. In your normal ranges, uh, your mass is not going to, in the straight line portion of your H and D curve, mass is not really going to affect your contrast. Realistically, in full disclosure, KVP is not going to change it all that much either um, in the straight line portion, unless you use uh, an unreasonable KVP, either you know unreasonably high or unreasonably unre low, you're probably not going to see just a whole lot of a change in your contrast. Uh, the registry still does say that KVP is the, the technical factor that we will use to control contrast, but I just want you to know that uh, if you change your contrast a little bit, you're really not going to see any difference on your image receptor. Same thing with filtration. Uh, filtration, if if 
you're working with a machine where you can change the filtration out a little bit um, and maybe go from 2.5 millimeters of aluminum to maybe 3 millimeters of aluminum, you're not going to see a whole lot. Um, but theoretically what you've done is you've increased the average beam energy so even though you remove some photons what you're left with is more likely to penetrate and since it would be more likely to penetrate the theory would be that your contrast would decrease voltage waveform uh, because um, because when you change from single phase to three phase you increase the average beam energy um, because your voltage waveform never never drops to zero your average goes up the average increases then likewise what you get in your remnant beam or, or in your primary beam is a higher energy so you get an increase in numbers but you also get an increase in, in average energy and as a result that could negatively affect your your contrast in clinical practice if you were working in a, a single phase and a three phase room the most obvious dif difference between the two would be if you did not adjust your technique and going from one to the other your S number or your index number would be changed generally by half uh, if you went from a, a three phase to a single phase it would show that you've uh, underexposed if you went from a single phase to a three phase uh, and you did not adjust your technique it would look like you overexposed and you would have and then SID uh, there should be no effect on contrast with a change in SID only in exposure so the primary beam from the focus things um, that determine the focal spot would be the, the filament and the angle of the anode um, we talked about that in in the last section one thing that we did not talk about is uh, off focus radiation uh, which is also referred to as extra focal radiation and off focus radiation occurs in um, on an area of the anode outside of the focal tract so you're still on the the face of the anode but it's off of the area of preferred bombardment so um, sometimes students will will have a tendency to to think of uh, off focus radiation as being like scatter radiation and it's not primary beam uh, radiation is what comes out of the x-ray tube so off focus radiation is not scatter radiation off focus is primary beam it's just unwanted primary beam so it occurs uh, and again Bouchong has a, a drawing of it it occurs whenever the electrons travel across the tube they hit the focal spot and they've got so much energy that they bounce off of the focal spot but the anode is still positively charged and the electron is still negatively charged so it's the, the anode is going to draw the electron back in so if it bounces off and it comes back into the anode with enough force to create an x-ray photon and if it creates a fo photon somewhere aside from the focal track you've got off focus radiation or extra focal radiation so effectively what that did was it increased the size of the focal spot and you know that if you increase the size of the focal spot you reduce sharpness of recorded detail so in a remnant beam um, what we have is what's left over after interaction inside of the patient so the remnant beam is the primary beam minus the photoelectrics that occur inside of the patient your remnant beam is your image forming beam those are your image forming x-rays so post patient and they are responsible for the density and the contrast so uh, the, what controls the remnant beam and, and how much we have in the remnant beam is your KVP and your mass so if we have our KVP and our mass set properly for the primary beam then we should have enough remnant beam 
to make an adequate image. So it's composed of uh, photons that are scattered and transmitted, the photons that are transmitted without any kind of interaction, and uh, again, only 1% or less of the primary beam actually reaches the image receptor. To review what we talked about in the uh, last chapter, sharpness recorded detail, ver uh, visibility recorded detail. Sharpness recorded detail again has to do with geometry and motion. Um, motion again being the, the main thing that you can't control that it can be most detrimental to your image. Got to control motion to the best of your ability. Um, you've got image receptor issues. He kind of saw that graphically in the in the videos that that got so pixelated. Um, I did change the setting on my recording so that if I do another video, I'm going to video in in high definition so that hopefully that pixelation will be gone. So there is a HD setting on the on the recording for the software I'm using. So image receptor issues, uh, we'll talk about those maybe not so much this semester, but we'll get to them. Um, you've got pixels in, in both your image display and also in your image capture as well. So that really controls your sharpness of recorded detail in your image receptor, your image receptor issues. Focal spot size is what we use to the, the technical or the, the, the thing inside the machine that we use to control sharpness of recorded detail. OID, we want to keep our OID as low as possible. We want to utilize a proper SID and we want to minimize any kind of angles that would cause distortion. Remember, when we're talking about distortion, we've got size distortion, which is magnification. That's an equal increase in size. And then we've got shape distortion. So that's all about sharpness or reported detail. Uh, this chapter is, is more so about visibility, uh, not just in density, which we talked about in the last chapter, but with scatter and how we minimize the scatter to increase that visibility. So the effects on scatter is that it is a density. It is a density. It is not density itself. Density is just the overall darkening of the image. So if you've got an adequate image and then you add a layer of density that's uniform all the way across the image, then what that's going to do is it's going to increase the density level. But at the same time, it might cover up some of the contrast as well. So uh, scatter radiation is just a layer of density all the way across the image receptor. It is, it in part goes towards the exposure to the image receptor. If you're photo timing, the scatter radiation is, is captured inside of your photocells and it does count towards what will eventually trigger your photo timers to discontinue the exposure through the timer circuit. So the effects of, of scatter on contrast are all detrimental. So if you have an image that has very little contrast, or I'm, I'm sorry, if you have an image that has very little scatter radiation, then you should have an image that has maximized its contrast. If you have one that has a lot of scatter radiation on it, then it's going to be very gray and uh, just not very appealing. So very black and white uh, is, is high contrast. If it's really, really gray, then you've got a, uh, in a lot of cases, you've got a scatter problem. So ideally, only non-interactive photons should be transmitted. So you might be thinking, well, if, if uh, only non-interactive photons, the penetrated uh, photons reach the image receptor, then I'm not going to have any contrast. But you will, because you, you've got to remember that contrast, the image receptor contrast, is determined by the patient contrast. So if we could remove all of the scatter radiation so that the only thing that we had was penetration, uh, photons penetrated, we would have less penetration under bone and less penetration under dense soft tissue than what we would have under less dense soft tissue in air. 
So we would still be able to visualize that difference um, and we'd be able to do so much better than what we could on an image that was covered with scatter radiation. So the effects of scatter on detail, on actual detail, the effects of scatter radiation on sharpness of recorded detail is non-existent. Um, scatter radiation is all about visibility only. But you got to have them both. Um, if you have an image that you've got really, really good detail, you've got a uh, um, an image that that uh, the lines are perfect, and you've completely covered it up with scatter radiation, you can't see it. So, is the detail there? Yes, the detail is there. And I'll I'll remind you of of the uh, little exercise I did in class before spring break, where I wrote. I think either detail or fog or or something on the on the whiteboard. I pulled the the screen out and wrote it behind it, and then asked you if if I wrote anything on the board, um, and then I, eventually I raised the the uh, the screen so that you could see what I wrote, and it was truly there. Okay, you couldn't see it because it was covered up, and that's exactly what scatter radiation does to our sharpness. Is it covers it up we can't see it so it reduces the visibility of that sharpness or recorded detail so uh, scatter radiation is all about visibility not about sharpness so this image kind of shows you what we're talking about so these are are really the uh, supposed to be very similar uh, images they're not exactly the same but if you look at, at this mountainous region here covered in fog, it looks totally different than this one without fog. So you can see the trees real well, you can see the, the, uh, the rocks really well, or over here uh, you've got no fog versus a very foggy image here so that you can visualize the, the, uh, um, the asteroids and the meteorites and everything in, in this image much better than what you can here. So uh, a, another example would be on a foggy morning if you're driving to work, uh, if you take the same drive every single day or to clinicals, you're, you're taking the same drive every single day, and you see the same trees. If there's a, a morning where you've got a very dense fog, you can't see the trees very well. You can probably see that they're there, but you can't really see any detail in the trees. So that's essentially what fog does to your image. By laying down a, a layer of density, I don't want you to mistake that, uh, that, that fog uh, and density are synonymous. I also don't want you to think that, that uh, an image that has no fog has no density. So scatter, um, it, uh, the, the way we can deal with scatter is to either limit its creation or clean it up after it is created already. And we talked about some of the ways that we can um, limit its creation. You can't eliminate its creation. It's going to be uh, a significant por portion of your remnant beam regardless of what you do. Um, and even regardless of, of what uh, tissue type you're making an exposure on, you're still going to have a significant amount of scatter radiation. So the first thing is to use adequate KVP. If you shot every image with very high KVP, you're going to create more scatter radiation than, than what you really should be creating. So you want to use a KVP level that well penetrates the anatomy but doesn't create so much scatter that it could cover up detail. So adequate KVP. Field size um, that refers to the, the size of your collimated field. Since um, every photon has the likelihood of creating scatter radiation, if, uh, if we eliminate the photons from the anatomy that we are not interested in seeing, then we eliminate the likelihood of some of the scatter radiation from being created. So collimation, if you increase collimation, 
as you increase collimation, that means reduction in field size. So increased collimation means to make your radiation field smaller. If we reduce the size of the radiation field, we reduce the amount of scatter radiation we create. Patient thickness, you're pretty limited on what you can do with patient thickness. You can compress uh, the patient. They use it in mammography. Uh, primarily in mammography, what they're trying to do is reduce the OID. Uh, but in compression, another thing that, that can happen is the tissue type gets spread out so that the thickness of the tissue is less significant. We don't have that luxury in a lot of things. I've, I've never in my entire career compressed a patient for a chest x-ray. So those are the things that you can do to, to limit its creation. Uh, once it's created, pretty much the only thing that you can do is uh, try to remove some of the scatter radiation with a grid. So grids selectively remove scatter radiation. So again, we've got four different possible interactions. <coughs> so we've got um, uh, x-ray photons that scatter away from the image receptor. We've got scatter that goes towards the image receptor. We've got transmission and we've got uh, Compton scatter and photoelectric. So classical scattering, uh, we've, we talked a little bit about that. It may parallel transmitted photons. Uh, it's also called Thompson scattered scattering. It's uh, not as important as other interactions and it occurs even though it says there's no loss of energy. There's no real significant loss of energy but it, uh, Bouchon goes on to say that uh, it occurs at low energy. So you figure that one out. Uh, low energy photons strike anatomy but uh, don't diverge uh, significantly so there's no loss of energy. Photoelectric interactions are the highest contributor to patient exposure. Uh, a photon that loses all of its energy uh, deposits all of that energy inside of the patient. So uh, photoelectric interaction is total absorption. So that photon that is photoelectrically uh, interacted inside of the patient is all patient dose. But we have to have those. Um, we have to have photoelectric interaction so we can see differential absorption. They're the worst for the patient, but they're the best for the image. Compton interactions contribute highest to the occupational dose. So I'm going to back up one graphic and take a look at this. So what we have is uh, photoelectric. We've got transmission. We've got uh, scatter towards the image receptor. And why this uh, graphic is in here backwards, I'm not 100% sure. And then we've got uh, scatter away from the image image receptor. So in both cases, these two here uh, would be uh, scattered photons. This one affects the image, this one doesn't, and that's good for the image. But if you're standing right here, then 100% of your occupational dose is going to be scatter, uh, Compton scatter. That's where all your dose comes from. And scatter, uh, the, the Compton is not limited to um, the uh, photons that just change directions. Actually, the photoelectric photons inside of the patient will kick off a secondary photon and it occurs exactly like characteristic x-ray creation inside of the, the target. The patient becomes a target. We eject a, a, uh, an electron. That electron gets replaced by another electron and the patient kicks off a, a scattered photon in the same way that characteristic is, is formed inside of the x-ray tube. So um, your radiation dose comes from those two sources, uh, which are both considered Compton scatter, uh, both the secondary photon and the, the, uh, the photon that just changed directions. So that's where all your dose comes from. So again, photoelectric, uh, classical scattering is, is your coherent or Thompson. Compton is your dose. And then these two, your 
Oop. Uh oh. Those two you should be learning about in radiobiology. Just more of the same stuff. I'm not going to spend any time on that. So the factors affecting scatter production, you got KVP, um, you got field size, and you got patient thickness and tissue type. So KVP questions. Uh, how do they change? How do changes in KVP affect X-ray production? How do changes in KVP affect penetration? How do um, changes in KVP affect patient dose? What kind of techniques are better for patient dose? Can anything compensate for a lack of penetration? Can mass? Can the computer processor? Can the computer algorithm um, make up for a lack of penetration? How do changes in KVP affect occupational dose and what precautions are best for technologists? Do changes in penetration affect scatter? Do changes in scatter affect contrast or latitude? Uh, how does scatter affect density? What is the preferred method to control density? What about patient whenever we have a, a change in patient size? What about um, as tissue composition changes? Like for example, what if femur is added uh, to the 10 centimeters of tissue and on the table in, in uh, figure 14.1 or how about a skull or c-spine what do those changes do to the patient dose so um, occupational dose all about Compton scatter again and this graphic just kind of tells you what kind of interactions you're going to have inside of the patient uh, at different KVP levels. So if you notice at 50 KVP your photoelectrics dominate. At 50 KVP um, 75 or 79 percent of your your uh, um, interaction inside of the patient is photoelectric. 21 percent would be Compton. So yeah they, they say that that's greater than 99 percent. Um, 100 percent is what they're describing here so uh, yeah that would 100% would be greater than 99% so your total transmission would be less than 1% changing from 50 kvp to 60 kvp changes things quite dramatically so now 70% is photoelectric 30% is Compton you still only have 1% transmission so if you increase, let's say, all the way down to 90 kVp, now your photoelectrics are cut in half. Your Compton um, increased from 21% of your beam to 59% of your beam, and now you've got 3% that uh, uh, penetrate through the patient. And if you go up from 90 to, we essentially went from uh, 79 to 30 eight percent uh, photoelectric from 50 to 90 but if you go up uh, another 30 kvp at this point then you drop even more dramatically to 18 percent compton 80 18 uh, percent photoelectric 83 percent compton and you get a quite a bit of penetration through the patient and again that's 10 centimeters of soft tissue so as kvp goes up the compton in the remnant beam uh, increases photoelectrics decrease, Compton increases, and we get a lot more penetration. So going back to our questions, um, how do changes in KVP affect x-ray production? Well, think back to your brim spectrum. Um, as we increase KVP, what happened to our brim spectrum? We've got to increase in average, we've got to increase in peak, but we've got a drastic increase in numbers. So it increases. Well, how do changes in KVP affect penetration? Going back down to this, total transmission equals penetration. Total uh, or transmission is your penetration. So less than 1% of your beam penetrated through the patient at 50 KVP, 10 centimeters soft tissue, basically the size of a shoulder. Um, at 120 KVP, 9% penetrated. So what happened to your penetration? 
it went up drastically. Um, how do changes in, in KVP affect patient dose? Well, that one's a little dicey, but we uh, talked about that in the last section. If the only thing you change is your KVP, if the KVP increases because of the increase in output, then um, your patient dose goes up. If you increase your KVP by 15%, your image receptor exposure increases by a factor of two. Your patient um, exposure would increase by less than two, but it's still going to be pretty dramatic. So when you're uh, asked the question about KVP and, and patient dose, if the only thing you change is KVP, nothing else changes, then your patient exposure is directly proportional to the changes in KVP. Um, your KVP increases, patient dose increases. KVP decreases, patient dose decreases. But if you increase your KVP by 15% and you maintain your image receptor exposure by decreasing your mass by a factor of two, your patient dose actually goes down. So decrease KVP with it. Uh, I'm sorry, increase KVP with a decrease in mass, your patient dose goes down. So um, conversely, if you decrease your KVP and increase your mass, patient dose goes up. So uh, what kind of techniques are better for patient dose? Well, it depends. Um, you know, well, it doesn't really depend. It, uh, high KVP, low mass techniques are better than low KVP, high mass. Can anything compensate for a lack of penetration? No, it can't. If if you got an X-ray beam that doesn't penetrate, you have no exposure to the image receptor. Yeah, but what if I increase my mass? If you don't have any enough KVP to penetrate the patient, you have no image receptor exposure. Yeah, but what if, what about your computer algorithm? That's really what controls your con contrast and density now. Uh, it's got to have radiation exposure uh, in order to manipulate that, that image. If you don't have any kind of image receptor exposure, because you have no penetration, then the computer algorithm uh, is a non-factor. Nothing can compensate for a lack of penetration. Not mass, not MA, not time, not computer processing. Nothing can can compensate for a lack of penetration. So how do changes in KVP affect occupational dose? Well, let's look back at this. Where did your dose come from? Compton scattering. Let's look back at this. What happened as we increased KVP? We increased Compton scattering. So what would happen to your occupational dose? As KVP goes up, your dose goes up. So what precautions are best for technologists? How do you protect yourself? There's three things, that being time, distance, and shielding. Um, I hope you're not seeing technologists stand out in the room unshielded with uh, when the x-ray beam is energized. Oh, when I was in clinical practice, uh, invariably there would be a, a technologist at some hospital, at every hospital that I worked in, who just found themselves to be brave for standing in the room without a, an, a lead apron on while somebody would energize an x-ray tube, while somebody would shoot a, an x-ray. Um, not a good practice, and I hope you're not seeing that. And if you are seeing that, I hope that you don't become one of those people. So. Uh, shielding, uh, vitally important. When you're making an exposure, stand behind the glass, uh, if at all possible. Stay out of the room. Um, if you have to be, let's say you're shooting a portable x-ray, uh, step as far away from the, the patient as possible. The inverse square law uh, comes into play there. The further you are away from the, uh, the patient, the less that Compton is going to interact with you. So step away from the patient, if at all possible. Uh, wear your lead apron if, if you can't get away from the patient. If you can't get away from the patient, stand behind the portable machine. That again is shielding. It's full of batteries in most cases. Batteries are full of lead. Stand behind the, the, uh, the portable 
for shielding and for distance. And again, limit your time that you have to spend in the x-ray room around the patient. So, the ways that you protect yourself, time, distance, or shielding. So, changes in KV, uh, changes in penetration, how do they affect scatter? Well, scatter is penetrated. Uh, or at least in this graphic down here, what we're talking about in transmission, 9% uh, transmission that is not necessarily just 9% uninteracted with patient transmission. That's total transmission. So that's Compton and those photons that didn't go undergo any kind of interaction inside the patient. So this incorporates this. So as KVP goes up, you get more transmission, but a lot of that transmission is Compton. So that's an important distinction to make. Um, so as, as penetration goes up, because you increase KVP, penetration goes up, but this, the, uh, the amount of remnant beam that is comprised of Compton scatter increases uh, in proportion to your KVP. So how does scatter affect contrast? Well, we're going to go back to this graphic. Scatter is fog, and how does fog affect your contrast? The more fog you have, the more contrast you have. Or, uh, I'm sorry, I just said that backwards. The more fog you have, the less contrast you have. So, um, contrast being opposite from latitude, how does scatter affect latitude? As KVP goes up, contrast goes down, latitude goes up. How does scatter affect density? Uh, again, that's a difficult question to ask. Um, density being overall darkening in the image, if, if you've got this situation going on, looking at that, um, you know, density-wise and how dark these two are, they're similar, really. And if you look at these two, this one looks lighter than that one, even though this one's covered in fog. So uh, it really depends on much more on, on what you've got going on. Um, you know, you can underexpose an a over penetrated X-ray, and you'll have too little density with too much fog. What I mean by that is if uh, if if you take an X-ray, let's say of uh, an abdomen, and you use 100 kVp at 0.5 mass. Well, your KVP is too high, but your mass is way too low. So what you're going to wind up with is this image that is way too gray, but at the same time it doesn't have enough density. So um, fog is a layer of density, but it's not the the determining factor in what density is. So what's the preferred method to control density? Well, can you control density with KVP? Absolutely you can. But as you increase your KVP, you're going to increase your fog, and that's exactly not what we want to do. That's, that's why we covered this chapter, is to, to discuss how it is that we're going to control our fog. So what do we want to use to control density or exposure, image receptor exposure? That would be your uh, mass. So well, well, what if we have a change in patient size? Well, most of the time whenever we have a change in, in patient size, it's soft tissue that accounts for the increase in size. So if you have somebody who on a KUB measures uh, 21 centimeters thick, and you've got somebody else that measures 41 centimeters thick, that's not all bone, that's all soft tissue. Well, what type of tissue creates more scatter radiation? That's soft tissue. So do you want to increase your KVP? Not so much. Uh, you would want to increase your mass uh, because if you increase your KVP, you compound the problem. The soft tissue is going to create more scatter radiation if you use KVP to, to compensate for the tissue thickness you again create more uh, scatter radiation.
and you compound the problem. So mass is the technical factor of choice. Uh, that said, um, sometimes you do have to increase your KVP. If you're on a limited exposure machine, you may have to increase your KVP instead of your mass um, in order to get the penetration through. But those are, are rare instances. So what about tissue comp uh, composition changes? Well, most of the time you can still use mass, but if you have a significant change in ZEF number, where you need to increase penetration if you've gone through um, all soft tissue and then suddenly you've got a bone in it, then you might need to increase your KVP instead of increasing your mass. Most of the time, most of the time, your patent answer, your stock answer for adjusting for um, uh, size, pathology, or, or anything is uh, 30 to 50 percent increase or decrease in mass depending on you know, what's going on with the patient.